So uh, some of you viewers may not know what's going on in Nicaragua and the Philippines. So I'm going to get, have Pedro and Zach give um, uh, a description of what's going on. But first, I'll, I'll have uh, uh, Zach give a brief summary of what's of the situation in the Philippines. So I'll let Zach speak now. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, about the situation in the Philippines, you know, uh, human rights, you know, violations. Yeah, I'll focus on human rights. Um, that's been occurring in the Philippines, you know, even, yeah, before um, Duterte um, sat, sat to power. Um, it is, um, I'm going to focus on you know, the EJK or the extrajudicial killings, um, political killings and press freedom. You know, when the current president, you know, came into office, so he campaigned for a drug-free country. So it came with a price and many lives were made to pay for it. And apparently, um, police operations um, involving anti-drug operations and their casualties move at a glacial pace. It's so slow. Um, only a handful of cases, sadly, um, have been solved. But in the case of 17-year-old um, Kia de los Santos, so which has um, resulted in the conviction of police officers. But, you know, the vast majority of, you know, the drug um, cases and the killings remains uh, unsolved. Um, on the other hand, you know, the killings of human rights defenders and activists became more amplified, you know, when the government used uh, various strategies against, you know, those suspected communists and, you know, terrorists. So what's more disturbing is that the military, the AFP in the Philippines, uh, the national security agencies and the police have actively used um, social media to red tag individuals. So like in red tagging in context, like, um, you know, you accusing um, individuals or groups, you know, uh, as suspected terrorists, which is um, very unjust. Uh, some reports show that these fake accounts are also known as trolls, which are, you know, um, purportedly associated with the government agencies. So as a result, when this infamous um, Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 was enacted, um, it was wet with heavy criticisms um, as the law was more likely to be used as a tool to target critics because of its vague and broad provisions. And lastly, uh, the press freedom has been under attack um, aside from filing of some um, Trump up or numerous charges against uh, Maya Ressa of Rappler uh, who are instrumental in reporting the EJ case, the and especially the ABS-CBN, the, the largest um, TV network in the Philippines, which is a company by uh, Sir Dibujo, was shut down by the Congress last year. Uh, it's uh, really more evident that these areas become, become more prevalent, especially when the COVID-19 um, started, you know, in March 2020. Um, sadly, uh, these authorities took advantage of the circumstances to restrain the rights and the liberties in the Philippines as by placing the country under some ridiculous uh, lockdown and restricting people's movement. Uh, what made really matters worse is that um, the selective justice can be seen on how officials detain the poor and subject them to the cruel treatment while the rich and the powerful are still able to work, walk free and without prosecution. Um, based on what's um, ongoing, um, the Philippines is indeed uh, being confronted with a silent epidemic of authoritarianism. Thank you. That's um, what I can say about the summary, what's happening in the Philippines. Thank you. And I guess um, it, it was a very good summary. Um, and I guess I can get Pedro now. He can give a, a presentation on uh, Nicaragua. Sure. 
Um, thank you. I'm going to share right now uh, a few slides uh, of my work. And um, uh, is everybody able to see that? Okay, great, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk uh, as an introduction on how I came into, into, into cartoon, very, very, cartoon very quickly. Uh, I grew up in the 80s in Nicaragua. I don't know if you remember this or even if you knew about this, but uh, we had a civil war going on in Nicaragua in the 80s with two sides fighting in, in, in Nicaragua. Uh, the, the side who was in power, who was Los Sandinistas, which it, it was Daniel Ortega, which is the same guy that is now in power in, in Nicaragua, but with the Sandinista revolution at the time, all right? So, and, and on the other side, there was the Contras, who were supported by Ronald Reagan uh, from the US. So uh, there was an economic embargo uh, on Nicaragua at that time. And as a kid, I didn't have access to uh, many things, including comics. So this kind of stuff, I never read it, okay? Superhero stuff, all the kind of stuff, I never read it as a kid. And uh, what I read was humor comics, comics like Mafalda or Buggy de Aceitoso from Argentina, comics from Mexi Mexico, Russia, Spain. So that's why I, I, I really like it to draw. So I get into cartooning because of that, because I like it humor. And that was, I was able to see at the time. Okay. Here is, this is my first cartoon ever. I did it like I was like 17 years old. And this guy is Daniel Ortega. Okay. So this is what is so depressing about this. I have spent my entire career drawing the same guy. And it's not funny. And, uh, and it doesn't get easier. And, uh, and yeah, and this, this cartoon wasn't even printed in anywhere. I did it just for fun when I was 17. So just to give you an idea on, on, on how long have we been dealing with this guy. Uh, a few cartoons that I did when uh, uh, back in, you know, 20 years ago now. Oh, this is the cartoon that I did uh, on 9-11. And um, this is a, a picture of a supplement, Humor Weekly supplement that I used it to, I created it and I used it to edit and it was published on the newspaper that uh, uh, in which I was publishing my daily cartoons in Nicaragua. The name was El Alacran, and it was a satirical weekly humor uh, publication that was published each Sunday. Uh, El Alacran in English is the scorpion, so that's why you are seeing that little guy there. Okay, so this is a cover, one of the covers that I did uh, back at the time. Here is another one. This is the kind of stuff that I was already using. I'm, I'm sorry, I was already doing when Daniel Ortega came back into power because he lost the elections, free elections in 1990. And then he was kicked out of power. Uh, and, but what happened is that since he, you know, since he lost that election, he tried to come back into power again. And he wasn't able to do it until 2006 when he made a pact with uh, uh, an agreement, a political agreement with the right wing party in my country. Remember, Daniel Ortega, he's supposed to be on the left, you know, and he made a pact with the right wing party in, in 2006 to change the electoral laws in order to be able to be elected with less percentage of votes, okay? So that's what he did, and that's, that's how he came back into power in 2006. And this one, this lady over here that you are seeing right now, that's uh, her, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> his wife and vice president, Rosario Murillo, all right? So Nicaragua, we are ruled by a couple, just like it was a monarchy, okay? Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo. Uh, a few cartoons, international cartoons that I have done over the years, just in case somebody doesn't know my work. Um, this is about the different uh, armed conflicts uh, all over the world. Here is about uh, uh, violence, uh, gender violence in Latin America. 
Here is another one about the war on drugs, which is a huge issue for a whole Latin America. Um, and here's, I think this is, fun fact, I think this is maybe my most popular cartoon in my entire career. I have seen this cartoon translated to like half a dozen of different languages all over the web. Um, so yeah, uh, few illustrations because I also do illustrations and a few cartoons back in Obama era with Cuba, some comics, stuff that I have done. And uh, I also do caricature. So this is uh, a sample of that, a few samples. Okay. So that's, uh, and, and these are my, the look of my editorial cartoons now. Okay. Um, here is another one about migration, kids who lost their families in Latin America and migrate to the US without parents. And um, a few cartoons that I have won, that have won, you know, contest some places, international cartoons, that stuff about everything. I, I do a lot of cartoons about Latin America, but also some other parts of the world, Russia and everything. Here is one from Venezuela, that's Maduro, Nicolas Maduro from Venezuela. Uh, this is from the Trump era, Trump tweeting. Um, uh, this is Kim from North Korea. Um, Steve Bannon from the US. And now we are going to talk about Nicaragua, okay? So this is one of the cartoons that I did back in 2018. So what happened in 2018? What happened was this. Remember that this guy has been back into power since 2006. He started his new presidential period in 2000, January 2007. Since then, uh, the situation in Nicaragua uh, for people who works about, who works with human rights and civil liberties, liberties have been getting difficult and difficult and difficult every year since 2007. And, uh, and of course, it has been always also difficult for independent press in my country. Uh, so, and the economic situation, it was never, you know, the best uh, of the situations. A few people were doing very well, the rich people, okay? The rich people who had a pact with Daniel Ortega. He will not mess with their business and they will not mess with his power, all right? So they had this kind of agreement and everybody was, everybody on power was very happy with it, but the, the people were was suffering. So what happened in 2018 is that a, seri a series of protests erupted all over the country because of reform to a social security law. And, um, and, 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 and it was a surprise for Ortega because he never thought that he would see thousands and thousands of Nicaraguans all over the country protesting against him. He thought he had everybody in control. Uh, so he got, you know, uh, he got in shock. He, he didn't knew what to do. So they started killing people right away. The, the protest began April 19, 2018. And uh, the next day, they, they started killing people in the streets. And the way that they will do it is that they will use snipers, okay? They were not just trying to scare people into protesting in the streets. They were trying to kill people just from the beginning. So they were using snipers. And the very, the very next day, students started to, to be killed by, by the government, and even a journalist, independent journalist, was killed the, that same way. If you, if you go into YouTube, I think you, you still can find the video. Uh, his name was Angel Gaona. He was doing a Facebook Live. He was a journalist. He was doing a Facebook Live of the protest. And actually, you can see the moment when he is hit by a bullet uh, to his head and he falls, right? So, and that started right away. And then things just started to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And these are the cartoons that I was doing at that time, okay? They were killing people on the streets and everybody was asking Daniel Ortega to get out of, uh, 
you know, the presidency to resign and also his wife. And they were just, you know, they couldn't see a reason why they should do that, even when they were killing people. And, um, and this is a cartoon that I also did uh, at that time. I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but there was kind of a, a big attention to this cover from time in 2018 that show with Trump and, uh, and a kid who's crying because of the migration crisis in the U.S. That very same week, that very same week, among the protests, you know, when the protests were, were happening in Nicaragua, the paramilitary of Daniel Ortega tried to get into a house, you know, because the house has like a, three floors and they wanted to get into the top of that house and put their snipers there to shoot people on the streets. And that family refused to let the paramilitaries get into the house. So they set the house on fire and killed everybody on it, including two babies, right? So that's when I did this cartoon. And then another case that it was very, very painful to to see in Nicaragua, it was uh, there was a uh, this case of a, of a father who was trying to run from the paramilitaries in the streets of Managua, and he was running with his wife, and he and he was holding his kid, in and uh, uh, you know carrying his kid on his arms, and one of the snipers killed the kid, put a bullet on his head while the father was carrying the, the kid, okay. And, and and all of this was happening when this was happening with Trump. So I tried to bring the attention of the world to what was happening in Nicaragua because what was happening in the U.S. was horrible, but nobody was talking about what was happening in Nicaragua at the time. So I, I came up with this idea. Here is uh, the dictator, Daniel Ortega, another cartoon, uh, and talking about all the dead uh, in Nicaragua. This is Angel Gaona. This is the journalist I was talking about. He is the one who was killed when he was doing a Facebook Live uh, uh, in Nicaragua. This comes from a series, if you can see, this is actually done by hand. The other, the other ones are done digitally because since 2008, almost all my stuff is done in, in a digital way. But um, one thing that I started to do in October of 2018, is to draw, uh, I, I, I challenge myself to draw every day of October to share an Inktober exercise. I don't know if you don't know if you know about that. Do you know about Inktober? Okay, so I don't have to explain that. So uh, I have, uh, at that time, I have done, you know, Inktober before, and it was a a fun exercise, you, just to uh, grab your old drawing tools and drawing actual paper and that kind of stuff. But of course, in 2018, I didn't have, you know, uh, I, I wasn't, my head wasn't into doing something uh, just for fun. So what I, I thought at that moment is that I was, I was going to use Inktober, which is international, to try to bring attention to what's happening in Nicaragua by drawing every day of October one victim of the repression. And I started drawing that. Every day I will draw somebody who was killed by, uh, uh, by the paramilitaries and the police of Daniel Ortega. And I have been doing so since. So this is going to be like the, the four year in a row that I'm going to keep doing uh, this project in October. Uh, I can talk about that later. So here is another cartoon about that. So talking about the press and about my situation. Uh, you know, we as a cartoonist, we are used to get hate mail all the time, okay? But when situations get as serious and as dangerous as, uh, uh, as uh, getting Nicaragua at that time, uh, you, you kind of start thinking, uh, in a different way and try to analyze those threats in, in a different light, you know, because w w those threats are coming from people who are already killing people in the streets. So you have to take them more seriously. So one of the things that the dictatorship started to do uh, after April 2018 
it was like, a, 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 like I was saying, one of the first victims was an independent journalist. Uh, but after that, they started chasing independent journalists to stop the rest of the war to know what was happening inside Nicaragua, okay? They will follow the journalists who were covering the protests in the streets. They will stole their equipment. They will threat them. They will beat them up. And then, and then they move it into doing something else. What they tried to do, it was to stop uh, the opinion media uh, um, to not let them work anymore. So what they did is that uh, after a few months of this uh, uh, situation, they started threatening journalists but also uh, the media outlets, independent media outlets. There is something important to share. All the biggest media outlets in my country are run by Ortega's Murillo's family, okay? All the most important TV channels are run by their family. Actually, each of their kids run one TV station, okay? And they have a lot of kids. And uh, the most in important radio stations, they also have it in, in their side because they own all of that. They, they were able to buy all those TV, TV stations and radio stations with the money that they got from the oil deal with Venezuela, the oil deal that they did with Chavez, right? So they used all that money for their own purposes, and they used it to buy all the biggest media outlets in my country. So independent media... It is very important because it's the only way in Nicaragua you can inform yourself about what is really happening and not just, you know, be listening to, to, to the dictatorship propaganda and the rest of the media, okay? So what they did, they were trying to silence independent media. And the way to do that is that uh, Confidential, which is the site, it's a news website, um, that publish my cartoons, where I publish my cartoons every day. Uh, they went into the building of Confidencial uh, one night in December. In the middle of the night, they got into, the police of the dictatorship got into, into the building and they stole everything they could get their hands on. Everything. They stole all the journalism equipment. They stole all the papers that they were, that were laying around. They stole cameras, they stole computers, they stole everything, and they left. Because they thought that, that by doing that, they will silence Confidential that way, and we were, not, we were not going to be able to continue working. But uh, the next day, we were able to borrow computers, you know, to keep working. Uh, people will offer their personal computers to keep working. So we kept doing it. So they saw that and they got back into the building the very next day and took possession of the building. Okay. So actually, as we are today speaking here today, they are still inside our building. Okay. So uh, that's what happened. Then one week later, they did the same thing with uh, uh, a few, one of the few independent TV stations. And, 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 and that night, they, 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 do it, they were doing it always in the night. They got into that TV station and they took two journalists and put them in jail, accused of terrorism, promotion of terrorism. And they were jailed for uh, half a year before International pressure was enough to, to be able to take them out of the prison. But, you know, and one of them, it's another, it's again in prison right now. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. I myself, I was covering uh, the marches and the protests in my city in Nicaragua because, um, well, I am a cartoonist, but also I was uh, covering this as a journalist for Confidencial, to report to Confidencial. So this is one of the pictures that I took back then. Here, this is me actually working in the building that was taken over by the police, okay? This, thought, this picture was taken two days before they got into our newsroom. 
And, and it, this was uh, that office at that time. And here is how they left it the first night after they came in the first night. Okay. All of this, all this empty space, it was full of computers and, 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 and cameras and all that stuff. And they took away everything. And this was taken on the day after the first ride, after they came in uh, again into position of the building. Here's a one of, uh, here are some cartoons that I have done about uh, Ortega and his wife, Rosario Murillo. There is another one again, same one. Then because of that, I, uh, a lot of independent journalists in December, after what happened with our newsroom, a lot of journalists decided to go into exile in order to find a way to keep working. So I was one of them. Uh, and I left uh, Nicaragua in December 2018, and I came into the U.S. And this is a cartoon that I did when I came in here to talk about migration. And, um, but I kept doing my cartoons about Nicaragua. As a matter of fact, even with everything that has happened to us since, we haven't stopped working a single day. I haven't missed a single day of cartooning since 2018. And we are in 2021 now. And I keep doing my cartoons every day. A uh, few more cartoons. Oh, when I came here, I was invited to join counterpoint.com, which is a website that publish uh, cartoonists from the, uh, um, all the political spectrum here in the US. And, and this is, these are one of my most recent cartoons or counterpoint, so you can have a look at that. But I keep doing cartoons for Nicaragua. This is one of them. Uh, uh, in last year, the dictatorship also passed uh, three laws to punish uh, not only uh, independent press in my country, but also freedom of expression in social media, okay? So it was known as the GAC, GAC law, it will be in English. In Spanish, it's La Ley Mordaza. So one of the ideas that we did with the other cartoonists in Nicaragua, it was that we, we talked we we'll talked to each other and we decided that in one day, in one day we, are going, we were going to publish. All of us was going to do a cartoon, you know, rejecting the, the God Law and do a cartoon about that. And this is the cartoon that I did for that day. And, and, and all of us used the same hashtag. And, and it was uh, very good and very successful uh, as, as a way of protesting. This is another one of my recent cartoons about Nicaragua's situation. What they are doing right now, we are supposed to have elections this year. So Ortega is so fearful that he, he, he can lost that uh, what he has started to do right now is that everybody who come, you know, and says, I want to be candidate to the presidents, he put them in jail. So far we have 21 people just in the last month, okay? So it's, this, is, this is the level of craziness that is going on in my country. And um, a few other cartoons that I have done while I'm here. Here is a, a cartoon that I did this week about how we, we no longer have uh, an election road to uh, get out of this situation. And... Um, so those are a few of my cartoons. And, um, you know, I can talk a lot of, I can talk about a lot of things, but I think it will be better if you have questions that you would like me to answer about how things got into to this point and how are we working or anything else that you would like to ask, I'm here to answer. Thank you drug war right ha now happening in the Philippines is, you know Zach talked a little bit about that um, you talked about the um, attacks on the free press all of them have had um, experience with that especially Dibujo Gasco works for ABS-CBN and you know when he when you have time you can talk about what happened to ABS-CBN and maybe all of you can talk about your own personal experiences with Duterte and the, the press I think the only thing is that for you um, 
uh, Ortega has been in power a lot longer than Duterte. Duterte yeah. has only been in power since 2016, whereas Ortega has been in power since um, 2006. Is that right? 2006. Yeah. So time. you're. So it seems like uh, Nicaragua was farther along in the road yeah. to authoritarianism than the Philippines. So what happens in the N Nicaragua seems to happen a year later. Regarding cartooning, uh, I did relatively fake cartoons for abs you know, because um, my editors are kind of wary of, uh, you know, offending the, the mm -hmm. government. Uh, because we're trying to get a fresh 25-year franchise, right? So, so my cartoons are relatively safe as long as my editor permits. But I still, I still do uh, my personal work and I um, publish them to Facebook, to social media. That's where I, I really hit the, the guy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I do every day. Almost every day, you no. Know, uh, I do cartoons exposing his inefficiency, uh, especially during this time of pandemic, you now when his uh, incompetence is being exposed, you know, um, had to resort to lockdown here because he really could not control the, the virus and. <laughs> He should have done earlier, uh, but um, he was so close with China that uh, he delayed the enforcement of the, uh, the uh, prevention of uh, travelers from China to get to the Philippines. Uh, and as a result, you know, the virus spread here. Mm -hmm. So those are the things uh, he didn't want, really want the people to know, which is why uh, he targeted networks like ABS TV to, you know, to really control the flow of information. So that's how uh, we got affected, as far as ABS TV is concerned. But there are also other media outlets who are uh, perceived to be critical. Uh, to the government, like Rappler, it's an online outfit also. Uh, Inquirer, it's a uh, newspaper, you know? and he is also exerting uh, effort to silence this, uh, mm. to silence this uh, establishment. May, it may not be like Nicaragua yet, but God forbid, uh, I hope we don't <laughs> reach that point. In Nicaragua, what Ortega does is that uh, he's ashamed to accept that he go after his political enemies because he's afraid of them. So he tries to put, to, to come up with crimes that he could accuse them of to, 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 to get them into jail, right? To go after them and sometimes uh, the, the you know the accusations that they do are so ridiculous they would say that they are terrorists they would say that they are avoiding i don't know anything that could come up uh, on his mind but i was wondering if, or, if duterte could use something like uh, another thing that Duterte will do is that everybody who is against him in nicaragua he automatically labeled that person as anti-patriotic all right they are pawns of a, uh, of a, 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 an external force that wants to get into Nicaragua and take over Nicaragua and he is protecting the country and everybody else is a traitor you know and uh, that's another label that he will use a lot uh, and uh, I, I was wondering what what are the Duterte's label? For their any for his enemies. Hey guys, maybe you can share uh, the story about red tagging. I think uh, it's fun. Um, when he was uh, campaigning, you know, as a president, just like what what populists do, 
the first thing that they do is like you know create create a problem you know like they make people perceive you know a certain problem that is not necessarily a problem but he made it as a problem you know like what trump you know did like he 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 point out migrants as a problem uh what duterte did you know he made he made people see or perceive you know that drug is a problem uh, i think uh, pro- pro- proliferation of drugs you know in the philippines has been uh, a long standing problem um mm-hmm. even decades before duterte came to power and he won on that on that um at, on that platform but it was interesting during that time uh when duterte was still um campaigning um and he was um championing about um the war on drugs when he will win as a president it was interesting that you know those um people who are in the left on those who are identified with you know those activists there are many of them who supported duterte because um as you remember um duterte supported you know uh, the end of contractualization so during the first year of um duterte's um duterte's term uh he was able to successfully um capture or many um drug drug dependents uh, drug pushers mm-hmm. some of them allegedly killed um mm-hmm. you know it was still uh you know a, a little bit you know the political political climate was still a bit okay and in like what you know on what um pedro said uh he used this um he used this um drug war as an um, excuse to um to to point out those um politicians who allegedly um are part of the the drug he made this list called mm-hmm. the drug narco list so where he list um politicians uh you know from the lowest um political unit the barangay in the philippines down to local government units the cities and municipalities and it was kind of weird because um while there are some um politicians who got who were called to senate um to testify or to to prove their their innocence and there were some um drug there were some politicians who were part of the drug narco list who were removed and eventually became the allies of the president so you know um this drug narco list became you know his instrument to instigate um critics and eventually when duterte didn't didn't um didn't uh fulfill his promise to end contractualization so around 2017 2018 these people who are part of you know the le- the far left turned against him so when these people turned against him um duterte intensified his efforts against um those activists he his his he, his police uh, the the philippine national police um dispersed this um dispersed those rallies peaceful rallies and that's why that's how it le- lead to um the proliferation of the internet trolls um doing um as what um dibuho said uh, red tagging tagging those um those activists those um demonstrators as terrorists The Catholic Church is very critical of Ortega. And that's the reason why actually one of the bishops had to go into exile because of that. So it's it is very serious, very very serious in Nicaragua. Yeah, I mean the Catholic Church you know, has been uh, consistently um, voicing out their their position against um, against the Duterte. Uh, but what I think is that you know they have been um diplomatic um their message is not uh, subtle um they're not that uh, you know directly call people to action you know their their key officials um their name of their um the the highest uh, i think the highest um body is the CBCP or the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines 
when mm-hmm. you know Duterte was elected as a president, um, they also elected um, someone from Davao as the the president of the CBCP. Maybe it's to ano, to to cool the the tension between the, the the Catholic Church in the Philippines and, and the government. But you know, it's it's been you know it's been it's, it's so ugly because you know, I'm um, just like the other. Uh, you know Duterte in his speech, public speeches, he cursed, he cursed, you know, against um, you know the Catholic um, bishops, mm-hmm. you know the archbishops, which is you know really, really, um, uh, it's really ugly. We have a president who wants to show he's a tough guy because the the previous. President, Senor uh, Benigno Aquino uh, III, was kind of, um, he, he was a decent guy, but he, he doesn't talk stuff. You know? uh, mm-hmm. As a result, uh, he's quite distant uh, to, from his constituents because um, Filipinos love um, what they call this. Uh, Filipinos love uh, anti-heroes, uh, mm. um, and uh, we have and enter uh, Duterte who talks tough, who promises to go after drug pushers, drug, drug addicts, and that's his promise, no? And so what he does is curse, curse and curse. Mm-hmm. He, sometimes he curses. Uh, uh, even at the poll, uh, one time before he before he ran for president, uh, uh, he was stuck in traffic because uh, the Pope visited the Philippines. No, and there was a mother change, and uh, what he said is, uh, if I I remember it right. Uh, go home because uh, it costed <laughs> so much traffic. Huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and right. uh, one time uh, he also questioned uh, he also questioned God because. Um, we have Jesus Christ uh, was crucified, and uh, and he said, "What kind of God is this?" No, no, he was not right. start talking that way. No, and um, just like he uh, talk stuff, and um, he he is actually tough, tough on the poor. No, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, that's his. Um, that's most of his followers come from the poor you know, because they, they believe that uh, here comes a guy who will save us from the bad people and unfortunately most of those who were killed during the drug war are the poor those uh, Duterte uh, because Ortega you know he he has the Congress on his pocket, and he has the judicial system on his pocket, and he has the police on his pocket, and he has the military on his pocket. Is that the same thing in, yeah. in Philippines? What is the same? Yeah. I think okay. um, for what uh, Pedro has mentioned, majority of the the justices in the highest uh, court of land, the Supreme Court in the Philippines, is appointed by him. And his chief is the current chief justice. Uh, chief Justice Hesmundo is is uh, the third ally. Um, you know, it is noted that uh, Hesmundo has voted uh, many um, cases that favors um, the late dictator uh, Ferdinand mm-hmm. Marcos, um, the former president, and mm-hmm. you know, kleptomania. kleptomania. And in the Congress too. In the legislative, where he, he has this, he was proud of this, um, the super majority, wherein mm-hmm. the two thirds, um, over two thirds of the the peop- of the representatives of the lower house are mm-hmm. identified to be his ally, and became mm-hmm. instrumental, became the reason why the ABS-CBN was shut down because mm-hmm. of his allies. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing in, in my country. Ortega controls everything. 
everything. And, and if you see it that way, he, he has control over Congress, over justice, over police, over military, over media, most of the media in my country. So it's, it's kind of hard to get the word out of what is happening down there. Now that you're talking about it, this is kind of interesting because, you know, Duterte sets himself in the right, right? In the, in the, in the far right, I would say. And Ortega set himself on the far left, but in the end, they behave the same way. And um, so for me, ideologies, you know, I don't really care anymore about ideologies anymore because, you know, Nicaragua has suffered from right, uh, far right dictatorships and far left dictatorship. And they are both equally evil. So um, it's very interesting because, you know, Ortega never gives interviews. Does Duterte gives interviews to independent journalists or international journalists? <laughs> you guys answer that. I, I know the answer, but it's, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. Actually, uh, Duterte uh, was, uh, I think, uh, first president after Ferdinand Marcos, who, who did not uh, entertain an uh, interview from any other independent uh, news outlet. Mm -hmm. Because he's using the the government, uh, what's called it, uh, uh, news outlet, which is the what's called it, uh, the state media. Yeah, the state media. He's using the state media rather than uh, uh, mm -hmm. the independent news outlet. Right. So, and so there that, is no questions on the state media. Just They just put the microphone and he says whatever he yeah, wants. Right? Yeah. 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 So, well, one, same thing. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Duterte is doing that's similar to Trump, he makes it kind of a sport to insult journalists and stuff. Um, I, I'm not sure. Is Ortega the same thing? or you know? Yeah. The, the reason I was asking that is that it's the same thing with Ortega. Ortega, will, he will not give an interview since he, since he came back into power in 2006, maybe to just one guy, and it was somebody who knew it wasn't going to be a problem for him. But beyond that, nothing. After the, the, the biggest process began in 2018, he went to do an international interview. I mean, an interview with an international media outlet. And guess which one he chose to do that interview? Oh, Fox, Fox News. Oh. <laughs> and I mean, Fox News. And we are talking about a far left guy who, who went, who doesn't do interviews. And he decided to do this international interview with Fox News. And do you know why he was doing that? He was trying to get Trump's attention. And mm. if you see that interview on YouTube, he will, you will see that Ortega is using the same words, the same terms than Trump. He's talking about fake news and the bad journalism and all the lies that every, everybody, everything is a conspiracy against him. And he just wants to click Nicaragua of all the bad people and the same thing everywhere. So what I'm, my point here is that it doesn't matter if they are on the far left or the far right. If they are populist, if they, if they have tendency for authoritarianism, in the end, they are going to end on the same place. Eric de Limo was the, the chief of commission on human rights during, uh, when, before Duterte was elected as president. And back then, de Lima, as chief of the Commission on Human Rights was investigating um, uh, Duterte's manner of uh, eliminating crime in Davao City, where he was mayor. Uh, there was a pattern of, you know, killing suspects without uh, taking them to court. Very much like what he did when he was fencing the, the Philippines with drug addiction. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
there. So mm-hmm. what he did when he came into power was uh, first he used the social media to to berate, uh, to attack Delina's character. Delina is a single woman uh, mm-hmm. who had uh, relations with allegedly with his driver. So he uh, he he and his minions attacked her character. You know. Somebody came up with a sex video of the the Lima. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard of that. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Uh, uh, all this time, uh, the Lima was already elected as a senator. Mm-hmm. So uh, they started attacking her character. Then later on, um, they used uh, drug allegations. You know uh, because. At one point, she was tasked to to check the new Bilibid prison, no? the huge prison facility here in the Philippines. No? Uh, then uh, they accused the Lima of getting into cohorts with drug lords in the new Bilibid prison, no? giving them, he allegedly gave them easier time in prison. No? Uh, she allegedly... Um, uh, collected payola from uh, and they use these allegations to jail her. So she's now in jail for uh, nearly uh, for so many years now. You know. mm-hmm. um, that's what he did against his uh, critic. So that I, I can't really say if uh, um, it was an instant ascent to power. But uh, what Duterte did is befriend those people who had the ability to, to elect him. Then later on, when mm-hmm. these people criticized him, he uh, went after those people. Mm-hmm. What's going on with Pacquiao? <laughs> and then <laughs> after that, maybe Pedro can talk about um, because P- Pacquiao is the boxer, right, and stuff, and and he, uh, I, ni- I didn't think of him as a as a viable political political opposition, but maybe he is. But I for it, but for Pedro, you know, when they're finished and stuff, is there a opposition leader that Ortega is afraid of and stuff? But first, the Filipino cart is why Pacquiao. I'm really not sure, you know, what's, what's <laughs> going on between. <laughs> So, um, you know, just, just, uh, no, just um, to recall what happened yesterday. What happened yesterday uh, was that you know Duterte's, Duterte's uh, ruling party, the PDP Laban, as uh, no, the uh, this um, National Assembly, I think National, yeah, yesterday, and they hosted um, Pacquiao as the the president of that party, and. Uh, we recall again that you know Pacquiao has made um, some revelations to public that there is uh, corruption going on in some executive departments of Duterte's um, uh, administration. So it really made um, Duterte's Duterte's uh, really really um, angry and made some attacks, verbal attacks against Pacquiao. And this is a uh, quite you know quite an interesting development because <laughs> it is known that Pacquiao and Duterte has been political allies for many years. You know, as you recall, uh, Pacquiao and Duterte belongs to the same island. So you know, Mindanao is is really it's like you know a Duterte country. Mm. But you know, it's you know, I, maybe I think there's a possibility that. You know, in my opinion, I view it as something of a diversion. Maybe mm-hmm. it's it's a way, you know, for for Duterte or Pacquiao to divide the you know the opinion of you know those who oppose against Duterte because because um, Duterte's right. term is already ending. Maybe it's it's a way to to divide the the, the opposition. The real opposition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something sketchy. That's why you know in our cartoons with 
dibuho uh, in our recent cartoons we we draw Duterte and Pacquiao as you know doing a boxing match while, <laughs> while a common Filipino is eating an, an exhibition match an exhibition yeah. match <laughs> or like exhibition match I don't know in Philippines, but in Nicaragua, the problem is that we don't have real opposition. All the 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 the, the who were supposed to be political uh, uh, parties of opposition in my country, most of them are playing the game of Ortega. They are just there to to sell the idea that in Nicaragua uh, there are, there is something like elections or or other parties in the Congress, but actually they all work for him in some way or another. So there is not a, a, a charismatic some, uh, political leader, a strong leader. That's why people, uh, after what happened in 2018, people started to follow more uh, bishops of the, of the Catholic Church or independent journalists because they didn't have anybody to follow in the political arena. All right. So, and 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 that has been a huge problem for Nicaragua. I don't know in Filipinas, in Filipinas, if it's that something similar, or you do have uh, uh, opposition figures that could be a challenge for the third. Pedro, so are you saying is it mostly the Catholic bishops that are the real opposition leaders? Because you know, they, I mean, don't, they don't see themselves as that. Our either independent journalists. I mean, journalists. We are we are just doing our jobs, but because there is no more political leaders in the opposition, then people tend to follow to to go there to go to the Catholic Church for leadership or independent journalists for leadership so, because there is no actual opposition political leadership in my country. Yeah. So I'm wondering though, or at if, least, or at least the classic, you know way of seeing, which is, you know, a strong leader of a, of a position party, there is nothing like that in my country. And those who dare to take that place are put in jail. So nobody wants to be, yeah. okay? I'm wondering though, um, how does that make the, the, I mean, the bishops and stuff? I mean, because you're right next door to where Oscar Romero got shot, right? Mm -hmm. So how, yeah. how, how safe are the bishops now? In, in well, one of the most vocal ones and more of the, one of the most brave bishops that we have had in Nicaragua uh, the last years, um, Silvio Baez, he was forced into exile. Actually, the Pope told him to get out of the country because before something, you know, bad could happen to him. And, uh, and he's living in exile here in the U.S., actually. So uh, it's, it's a very dangerous situation for all of them. A lot of priests uh, uh, went also into well, a few priests, Nicaraguan priests, were forced also into exile because of the situation in 2018. And those priests who are not Nicaraguans, who, who were born in some other parts of the war and came into Nicaragua to work in Nicaragua, were expelled by Ortega's regime because they were critical of the government. So it is a very difficult situation for independent journalists, for the Catholic Church, uh, for everybody in Nicaragua right now. You know, same with um, same with Nicaragua. The problem in the Philippines is that um, the forerunner of the forerunner in the opposition is lacks, you know, quite you know charisma. Um, mm -hmm. The name is you know our current vice president, uh, Lenny Robredo. Um, he's you know, she's she's a potential candidate, but, you know, but the problem with her is um, the numbers has not been translating yet because mm -hmm. her numbers in the recent um, social polls has been single digit. While the forerunner is the currently the 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 daughter of the current president, who is Sarah mm -hmm. the Your Nicaragua's elections are right now. Yeah. While the Philippines is next is, is next year. Mm -hmm. Do you have any like advice for the Filipino cartoonists and what, what they should expect? So the path that Ortega have, has been following. He got back into, in, into, into the presidency in 2007 because of the fact that he did to change the electoral law to be elected with less votes. 
that part was done with the far right. He he saw himself at that time as somebody who was, you know, uh, uh, a Christian who wanted to make things right, and he asked for forgiveness for his past mistakes, and that that was his campaign. He got back in 2007 into power, and right away the first thing the first thing that he did is that he went to change the constitution uh, to allow himself to run as a president as many times as he would like to go. Then he went to, assure, to make sure that he had full control of police and military. Then he made himself sure that he had the majority of the control of the uh, electoral uh, power, I mean, the, the electoral institution. So when the next elections came in, uh, in 2000, uh, um, well, the first elections that we considered there was a fraud, electoral fraud, was 2008. So it was just one year after he got back into power. So he was very quickly, you know, uh, trying to get uh, uh, most of the control of the electoral institution. So by 2011, when he ran again as a candidate, he knew he was going to win because he had an uh, deep pockets to buy the uh, opposition, you know, to put candidates uh, that, uh, that, uh, that will not be a menace to him. And, and it was a problem. And, uh, and he was elected again in 2011. And he went and did the same thing in 2016. Okay? So um, what he did is that he was using a mix of, uh, you know, of classical corruption moves to, to, to remain in power, uh, controlling the electoral institution, giving money to a small parties that will play the game. Like you will see, you know, to see several parties in the presidential ballot, but most of them were, were parties that will have, I don't know, 10 people and not more, you know, but they were there just to sell the idea that of democracy, that there were a, that there were a lot of parties in, in Nicaragua. And, and he was and he had enough money to do that because Chavez was giving him all the money that he needed. So he was he went to do everything that he wanted. I, there are a few things that you have to 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 keep an eye on. Um, who are in charge of actually counting the votes? Who are the ones who are really going to declare a winner? Do you trust those people? Are those Duterte people? Uh, what about the opposition? Are there really opposition uh, leaders or are they just puppets of Duterte? Or be because something that Ortega did in Nicaragua is that for, for several years, he, he was on the ground helping some people to become opposition leaders. And once they had these characteristics of being opposition leaders, they suddenly, from one way to another, they were on the side of Ortega. So this is something that he had planned for several years. And, and that's something also to keep an eye on. And, and about, I don't know if in, how it is in Philippines, but in Nicaragua right now, uh, we are supposed to have an election, but nobody believes actually that it's going to be an election. I mean. All of the people who are saying that, that they want to run for president against Ortega and they have the less minimal chance they are put into jail. So nobody, nobody is, is seeing that it's going to be a true election. But the other thing is that they are using a lot of these new laws to control people. So, so uh, and they are also using trolls, you know, to go after people online. And that's something that all authoritarian regimes are doing right now. It doesn't matter if they come from the left or from the right, they are doing the same thing. I know um, I'm in America, so I'm safe. But when I read what's going on in the, Philipp in the Philippines, I'm actually pretty scared. I have relatives in the mm -hmm. Philippines and I don't 
like the direction that's happening. And, and but I, I admire you guys because you do have courage. You know, um, the political idiot in me. Um, we both we had we were talking a couple of weeks ago. We we really admire your courage, Pedro, and stuff because yeah. you know what you're doing is very brave. But I also admire you you guys' um, um, courage because you're in the Philippines. You're, you're criticizing Duterte, even though you know about red tagging and stuff. So I just want to know for all of you, I mean, how do you get your courage? And stuff? Because I know for me, you know, I'm, I'm safe, but I'm still kind of worried and scared because I don't, I'm, I'm worried about my relatives and stuff. So I, I don't know who wants to speak first, but, you know, I, I'm curious to know, how do you get your courage and how do you stay sane, you know, in, in the situation you guys are in? Well, for my part, I still believe in uh, elections here in the Philippines. So we still have, um, still have, still have the power to change our leaders, and uh, that is my hope. Uh, that that's the reason why I still continue to do cartoons in an effort to, you know, to change the people's mind regarding what they consider a popular president no. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's my hope uh, I, I want to to go after the trolls to go after the fake users you know, expose them educate the people uh, using my cartoons you know, and hopefully um, you know, influence uh, the voters to make the right decision come election time. So that is my hope. And because uh, um, uh, I think about my, my kids, my family, I, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want them to suffer anymore un under this current leadership. So hopefully we have a uh, a good president in the future. So that's what motivates me. You know what? What motivates me is you know having this you know uh, knowing that I have uh, there are many people who have the same uh, advocacy and you know line of work as me like you know uh, Sir Diboho, aka Isanta Sang Cafe, uh, political idiot. Um, and you know it's you know, there's sometimes there, there there's sometimes where I you know um, doubt myself should I continue this or not, but you know their their presence or their support you know has been you know encouraging because like first of all um, you know both sides of my family are either a political or they are the Duterte's supporters or enablers. Which is, you know, really sad because, you know, it's, it's a lonely world, you know. Like, in, in the Philippines, you know, most of the families has this culture of being apolitical or, you know, don't talk about politics and stuff. So, you know, what is one of the reasons why, you know, I partially concealed myself in public. And also one thing that motivates me is because, you know, I've been, uh, you know, uh, funded, you know, tax taxpayer funded scholar, and this this is also my way also of you know giving back. You know, we should we should be we should hold those powerful people you know account accountable for their um, actions, for their um, mistakes, and also uh, you know I've been running my page for a few years. And it's very glad to see that, you know, there's still many people, you know, send, send positive messages about, you know, keep, keep going, you know, just ignoring those, um, you know, those visual, you know, those verbal threats from the trolls or those rabid supporters of the current president. So, yeah, that's all. <laughs> On my part, uh, I actually don't find myself as being courageous. Uh, I'm just doing what I think is right and what is just because I don't want to have a Philippines that is the Philippines of the previous, uh, like the Marcoses, 
the ten the Philippines. I don't want to have the ten of Philippines. So, so I think I'm not. I don't think I'm courageous. I'm just. I'm afraid that <laughs> that the Philippines might go somewhere which is not the ideal uh, country. What I what I want for my children to have, you know. I'm just afraid that 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 things might go worse, you know. So, so like what my colleagues have said, uh, I, I think uh, what motivates me is I, think, uh, I, I still have hope for the Philippines that that the Philippines will see still the 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 sun you know the light uh, so so what's motivate me what motivate me is the the fear but uh, yeah the fear of having a Philippines in the dark ages again well about me what motivates me um, the fact that this is what I do this is what I enjoy doing. This is what I, where, where I found myself more useful uh, uh, to society, doing cartoons, saying what I think is wrong with what I'm seeing. And this is what I have been doing for more than 25 years now, I think. And, um, and it doesn't matter. I mean, these people, these uh, who are always criticizing you, but, but because of your work, you have to learn how to deal with that. And uh, I do remember that before this guy, when the far right wing party was in power in Nicaragua, I was called a, commu a communist. I was called many, many things. And then now when Ortega got back into power, suddenly I was an agent of the CAA, an imperialist pig and all this and all that. So, uh, Things really change all the time, but you actually, there are some people who doesn't understand that you are just doing your job, which is to criticize what you think is not well in your society, in your country. And it's your duty as a citizen to, to say it, you know, because that's how you can put your little, you know, help to, to make your country better. So that's what you do. And that's what I do. All some other people do other things. I do my cartoons. And um, this is my second exile, actually. When I was a kid, remember I told you that I, I grew up in the 80s when Daniel Ortega was a president. And I was 10 years old when, because of the civil war, my family was forced into exile. And I was 10 years old. And then 30 years later, happening again with me because of the same guy twice in my life, that's too much. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I keep doing this is that I think that somehow we have to change that circle of, the cycle of stupidity in my country and, 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 and try to build something new out of this situation. And even when this is my second exile, I do think, and it is my hope, that at some point I will be able to return to a free Nicaragua because that's what I want and, and that's what I work. It's not, you know, you are not cynical about this. You actually, you have hope because some people say, well, cynicism is what drives you, you guys to keep low when, when things are so horrible. But actually there is hope in what we do. Otherwise we will be, you know, depressive as many, many people. So we are trying to use all that and to put it into, into something that we believe it's, a, it's the way to follow. In this case, for me, it's to get out of the dictatorship in Nicaragua, to have finally fair elections and to be able to build something new out of all this mess that we have right now. <music>